Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on that great book in the Bible, right in the middle of the Bible, the Long Book of Psalms. And this is lesson number eight in that series for February 24 of 2024, entitled Wisdom for Righteous Living. Wisdom for Righteous Living. Hmm, what do you suppose that means? Let's begin, as always, with a word of prayer. Father, we <coughs> bow now in humble contrition before you. After studying what we learned last week and the lesson and realizing what an incredible salvation you provided us and understanding of the great controversy, how could we do anything but praise your name? So now give us wisdom in living righteously is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, okay, just from the top of your head, what's the definition of wisdom? We have a hard time with that one. Yeah. Okay. Being wise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's against the law. You can't define a word by using the word itself. How is wisdom, wisdom different from knowledge? Jim? A modern dictionary defines wisdom as the body of knowledge and principles that develops when a specific society or period, within a specific yeah. society and period. Wisdom also relates to the soundness of an action or decision. We also use wisdom to mean, quotes, the quality of, our, of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment, end quotes, Oxford English Dictionary. And then the Bible study guy says, wisdom relates to knowledge, including the ability to make a wise decision. Now think about that for a moment. What it's saying is, if you are really aware of some field, then when people ask you a question about that field, about that particular subject, you ought to be able to give a correct and good answer, right? And that's considered to be wisdom. Okay, when we meet someone with vast knowledge in a specific area of science or literature, we call him or her wise. I remember that Dr. Maxwell used to, tell, used to say that an expert is someone who has spent at least 10,000 hours studying one, one particular subject. 10,000 hours studying one particular subject. Wow. Wisdom in our common understanding today often refers to possessing ex expertise or knowledge in a specialized area. For some people, wisdom encompasses secret knowledge and the ability to decipher mysteries or reach a higher spiritual level. This week, we consider what wisdom is from a biblical perspective. Our study will not only define wisdom according to scripture, but also will attempt to uh, distill principles of wisdom from da for daily life. After all, what is biblical wisdom if not practical knowledge and the discernment to live every day according to the precepts of Christ? The aim of our study is to grasp and apply this biblical wisdom to our lives from our Bible study guide. Okay? Deuteronomy 10, 12, 13. Now, people of Israel, listen to what the Lord your God demands of you. Worship the Lord and do all that He commands. Love Him, serve Him with all your heart and obey all his laws. I'm giving them to you today for your benefit. For your benefit. Okay, so what does God say about his laws? They're good for us. They're good for us. How many people think that God's laws are good for them? Or any law. <laughs> any law. Or any law for that matter, <laughs> right, yeah. No, law has been nailed to the cross. But <laughs> well, of course... <laughs> If you think it needs to be nailed to the cross, what are you saying? You can do anything you want to, right, right. It's Today not good. Are. It's not good for us anyway, right? Yeah. yeah. They misunderstand what laws are. Yeah. Law is the way things work, like Protect gravity us. and buoyancy right, and so on yeah. and so forth. Rules and regulations and statutes and law codes is what people get together and make up, and then they can make exceptions for themselves and for other friends. Uh, law is not the way it's done. 
Well, it's the way it's done, I mean, but that, not the way it should be it's, done. It's not the ideal. Let's put that. Yeah, I, I, I misspoke there. The righteous do not just learn to love God and His ways, but they also hate evil. Mm. Oh dear, why do they hate evil? Because it damages and destroys God's children. So that's a good enough reason to hate it, right? From the teacher's Bible study guide. Thus, we can say that biblical wisdom is quote a way of viewing and approaching life which involved instructing the young in proper conduct and morality and answering the philosophical questions about its meaning, close quote, from, okay. from a source, evangelical dictionary. Yeah. Why is it necessary for us to understand the answers to philosophical questions about life's meaning? Is that important? What are the existential questions real quickly? Why am I here? Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? Okay. You think it's important for us to understand those questions? If we could. Yeah. So how should wisdom affect our lives in our day? In Old Testament times, wisdom was considered to be manifested when individuals had a mature faith and followed God's directions in their lives. Would that be true today? Why not, huh? There's no contradiction between having a relationship with God called faith and carrying out his deeds in our lives. If you really believe that all God's directions for us are for our good, why would you not want to carry them out? James 1, 5 to 8 says, but if any of you lack wisdom, sometimes I wonder about myself, you should pray to God who will give it to you because God gives generously and graciously to all. But when you pray, you must believe and not doubt at all. Whoever doubts is like a wave in the, in the sea that is driven and blown about by the wind. People like that, unable to make up their minds and undecided in all they do, must not think that they will receive anything from the Lord. Okay. So... If we followed all of God's directions in the Bible and we understood them carefully, would there be a lot of things that we would need to do that we wouldn't have any directions for? No. It's pretty comprehensive if you understand it correctly, isn't it? What are some of the features of wisdom? Now let's see if we can dig in a little bit more. Our Bible study guide says biblical wisdom is chiefly recorded in the form of poetry. Why would that be? Easy to remember, perhaps memorize? Possibly, but that's, that's sort of trying to push our rhyme and rhythm back into Hebrew, Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry is not like that. Well, it's parallelism. It's parallelism, and that's, the, and that's why I think it's really important, because God is saying, if you want to know what this is, Compare it to this. If you want to know what this is, compare it. And, and sometimes it's, if you, want to, if you want to know what this is, it's opposite to this. So these are parallels. And so parallels are similes, metaphors are, we use them all the time. And they're excellent ways of trying to see. It's not like this, it's like this. That's two similes, two metaphors, right, isn't it? So these are great ways to learn. And so that's why Hebrew poetry is very appropriate. Repetition, immediate repetition. Yeah. And, yeah. The books of Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes are the representatives of wisdom literature in the scriptures. Those are the ones that pretty much everybody recognizes. Some authors include Song of Solomon, too, in this grouping, although it must be noted its inclusion is subject to debate. The main themes of biblical wisdom are creation. Think about why these are the main themes. Creation the law, counsels for wise and mature living, and the fear of God and retribution. What are we talking about here? Where did we come from? Why are we here? <laughs> Where do we go after we die? I mean, look at it. The book of Proverbs is perhaps the best known example of wisdom literature in the Bible. Chapters 1 through 9 depict the great value of wisdom. When these chapters are carefully read, one observes that the concept of wisdom comprises a set of teachings for living a godly life 
with advice about how to avoid the snares of unrighteousness and the wicked and the wicked. From chapters 10 onward, there are more than 600 sayings or proverbs, short sentences with practical advice applicable to various situations. By the way, uh, such as marriage, love, relationships, financial issues, political matters, children, education, etc., and daily life. How many proverbs did Solomon write? A lot more than are recorded in the Bible. A lot more than are recorded in the Bible, that's right. So were some of his more proverbs than a, not inspired? More than a thousand yeah. proverbs. Many the Bible. Probably for Egyptian. Uh, it may have had some basis in Egyptian uh, knowledge. Um, I don't, maybe he married a wise, very wise Egyptian princess. <laughs> and his Egyptian princess was his first wife. Fanny Crosby wrote uh, more than a thousand poems, uh, wow. songs. We have so many of them in our church. You know. Okay, so contrast what, we, what people normally do to the practical advice of the Proverbs. The book of Job is more of a, tre of a treatise on suffering, retribution, and vindication. Or is it the uh, book of Job about God's... Now, there's one of the things we, we've discussed. Or is the book of Job about God's character and God's wisdom, God's ability to correctly judge even in advance? Mm -hmm. These themes are concerned with wisdom, but from God's perspective, they unfold from the narrative of Job's life and his troubles. This analysis is not philosophical, but divine in nature. Chapter 28 is the core of the book. I would say 29 is just as important, in my opinion. And it ends with the idea that reverence and obedience to God are central to wisdom. Behold, the fear of the Lord, is that is wisdom, and to depart from, from evil is understanding. Job 28, 28. It's a great verse, and it's basically parroted in two places in, in Proverbs. Proverbs 1, 7, and not the exact words, but the same idea, and Proverbs 9, 10. So we would say that the main information, the main message of, of Job, is especially in chapters 1 and 2, and then all that stuff in between, and then chapters 40 to 42 at the end which reveal the great controversy of God's character and government and God's judgment of Job's character. So go ahead and see, where are we? Whose turn is it? I think it's Jim. Jim, can you go ahead and read Job 28, Job 28, 28 for us? Okay, verse 20. God said to the human beings, to human beings, be wise, excuse me, to be wise, you must have reverence for the Lord. To understand, you must turn from evil. Good news Bible. Okay, so if wisdom, as we noted up earlier, is exemplified in the life of someone who lives a godly life, then that would fit, wouldn't it? To live, live but according. So, had as part of that process, they chose to reject evil. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. What happens to a person when she or he leaves the way of sinners and begins choosing to follow God's plan for his or her life? Well, we've already suggested that Satan isn't happy. Listening to and obeying God's plan for our lives is not a legalistic observance of some rules. It is a walk with God, an intimate relationship, a life that is full of blessings. Okay, I think we're, I think, Charles, that's yours, isn't it? Yeah, Psalms 119, 9 to 16. How can young, young people keep their lives pure? By obeying your commandments. With all my heart, I try to serve you. Keep me from disobeying your commandments. Keep your law in my heart. I keep your law in my heart, so I will not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your ways. I will repeat aloud all the laws you have given. I wonder I, if that means he had actually yeah. memorized them. Mm. I delight in following your commands. By the way, this is David. He yeah. fell, he got up. He fell, he got up. More than in having great wealth. I study your instructions. I examine your teachings. I take pleasure in your laws. Your commands I will not forget. But let us not deceive ourselves into thinking that the, day of, the way of God is a way without challenges. Mm -hmm. The great controversy is still ongoing and the devil is alive and well. Ellen White says, the evil way is 
littered with thorns and other things like that. It's not, it's not just an easy way either. Uh, but God recognized that he must allow testing to let his children's faithfulness, or in some cases unfaithfulness, to be clearly revealed. Each person must be given a reasonably fair opportunity to decide on which side she or he wants to be. So the question we might uh, want to ask is, why are human beings attracted to sin? Okay, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for some real wisdom to come out of your mouth. Because we're humans. Come on now, I can't do anything about that. Emilio Kennedy used to say, sin happens to be fun for a season. But it <laughs> leaves us miserable. But yeah. yeah. So. Is it clear that even in this life, having a godly life is beneficial? From the Bible study, Bi Bible study Guide, the Bible depicts a daily life of faith as a pilgrimage or walk with God in his path of righteousness. The life of faith is maintained by walking, quote, in the law of the Lord, and by walking, quote, in the light of your countenance. These are by no means two different walks. Walking in the light of God's countenance implies upholding God's law. Equally, walking in the law of the Lord involves seeking God with the whole heart. From our Bible study guide. Myra, you want to? Psalms 89.15 says, How happy are the people who worship you with songs, who live in the light of your kindness. Good News Bible. Have you ever tried to imagine, I mean, obviously people have tried to do this, to imagine what it would be like or what it will be like, I guess, when we get to heaven, but even here on this earth, what it would be like to live in a place where everyone was always loving and kind and forgiving and... Isn't it like that in your house? Isn't well... It, isn't it in yours? <laughs> <laughs> What are you implying? <laughs> okay. We'll settle we'll, that at home. Yeah. <laughs> That's what she should be saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being undefiled in the way is another way that a psalmist describes, uh, the psalms describe the righteous life. Psalms 119, 1. Undefiled describes a sacrifice without blemish that is acceptable to God. Exodus 12, 5. Likewise, the life of the righteous individual is a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1. So, what is a living sacrifice? Yeah. Sacrifices are supposed to be dead, right? Well, giving up something, it's... A living sacrifice is someone whose life represents God everything he does all day long. Thus a love for sin must not defile it. A life devoted to God is always a perfect way, meaning that the person assumes a right direction in life that is pleasing to God. From our Bible study guide for Sunday. What is supposed to be our main challenge, our main work while we are on this earth? Now let's go and look at that verse, Romans 12, 1. Jim? So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. This is the true worship that you should offer, Good News Bible. The true worship means then that we should live lives that are a constant representative of God. Life-like, I mean, uh, God-like lives. Our Bible study guide goes on, keeping God's commandments has nothing to do with the legalistic observance of divine rules. On the contrary, it consists of a good understanding of the difference between right and wrong and good and evil. And there's verses there. And involves the whole person, not merely outward actions. Being undefiled, keeping God's commandments and seeking God uh, with the whole heart are inseparable attitudes in life for the person who wants to live a, a really faithful life. We, we have that word relationship somewhere. Mm -hmm. To me, that's really the bottom line. With this, we, by ourselves, we cannot keep the law of God. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. 
And if the law keeper leaves it, we can us keeps it in our own lives. That's why I like I like uh, Isaiah 61 verse 10. I'll, I'll greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful with my God, for he has clothed me with garment of salvation. He has wrapped me with the robe of righteousness. His righteousness. Yeah. He wrapped me with. So he keeps his own law in my heart. You and I don't think about, you know, keeping the Sabbath. No, we long for. I mean, no, I can hardly wait for the sun to go down on Friday evening. This yeah. is Sabbath, man. This is delight. Yeah. That's no law to me. I think if we really understood the plan of salvation, we really understood the life and death of Christ, we would say, how would I ever dare intentionally going against it in any way? Amen. It's not a sin to be tempted. Think of the story of Jesus in the wilderness and of the temptations by Satan trying to get him to sin. If you remember, I've mentioned this several times, but when Jesus was born, as a baby, Satan had three plans. The first one was, okay, no human being living on this earth has lived without sinning. I am going to get this baby to sin. He failed. As, as Christ's life was drawing to an end, Satan became more and more worried. He said, well, if I can't get him to sin, at least let me make his life so difficult that he'll just give up and go back to heaven, just leave these human beings to me, Satan. As he failed in that, and finally Jesus is dead in the tomb, Satan has one more chance. He said, I'm going to keep that tomb closed. And how well that did he do? Well. <laughs> that didn't work, did it? No. Yeah. One angel, well, two angels from heaven, Ellen White says, came down, one rolled back the stone. And we, 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 we look at the story of the, the, the hundred Roman soldiers. I mean, the hundred Roman soldiers were nothing. Satan and every one of his angels are trying to keep that, that tomb closed. But using our imagination to build this picture, I just see them scattering yeah. as soon as two angels from... Yeah. <laughs> Falling like dead men. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, it's, it's not nice to think like this, I guess, but I want to see what day Satan was doing. He was running as fast as anybody else. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, wow. Okay. Um, and of course, the story of Christ's temptations is in Matthew 4, 1 to 11. It's also in, in uh, Luke. So what is our challenge? Why is it so difficult at times to live a godly life? Could we call this the human predicament? So let's see, where are we? Gordon, I think that's yours. Psalms 90, verses 8 to 14. This is a psalm by Moses. You place your sins before you. Our you place our sins. You place our sins before you. That's correct. Our sins where you can see them. Our Se secret sins where you can see them. Seventy years is all we have. Eighty years if we are strong. How about 90, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yet all they bring us is trouble and sorrow. Life is soon over and we are all gone. Teach us how short our life is so that we may become wise. How much longer will your anger last? Have pity, O Lord, on your servants. Fill us each morning with your constant love so that we may sing and be glad all our life. Good News Bible. Okay. We need to remember constantly that God's plan was and is for us to live in a perfect environment for the rest of eternity. That's uh, God's plan. You, you posed a question a little while ago and it says, why is it so hard to live a godly life in this world? Um, I travel quite a bit mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you may not agree and I have been struggling. Maybe I should make this comment afterwards and maybe I should do it now. As long as the organized church will last, it will be difficult for many saints to live a godly life. I mm. think we're going to wake up very quickly and that's going to happen sooner than we think. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to find ourselves on our own. You are the church, not the organized church anymore. Yeah. I believe it's going to be very easy for us to walk that day a godly life. That's my thought. Yeah. Well, if we don't figure out how to do this for 
you know, in our own personal relationships, but we're not going to be saved because our, our names are on some church books. So God's plan for us, every one of us, is for a, to live forever in a perfect environment. Amen. That's God's plan. Okay. I think, Myra, it's yours. Bible study guide. The uh, fallen human ex existence is but a vapor in the light of eternity. You know, as we age, and Gordon made a comment recently, uh, we are realizing how short life is. Yeah. The older we get, mm. life gets shorter and shorter. And you look at it in the window of eternity, and it is a vapor. Yeah. A thousand years in God's sight is like a watch in the night, which lasted three or four hours. Compared to the divine to divine time, human lifetime flies away. This is Psalms 90. The strongest humans are anag. Anog analogous. Analogous, uh, these words, to the weakest among plants. Yet, I mean, we it, have trees that are 2,000 years old, at yeah. least. Yeah. Uh, don't get me started on that. Uh, yet even a, that short life is filled with labor and sorrow. Even secular people who have no belief in God mourn and lament the shortness of life especially in contrast to the eternity that's out there, and that they know threatens to go on without them. Oh dear, mm. how's, that re how's that eternity going to survive without them? But righteous people remember that God is our Father, protector, defender, and sustainer. He is always with us. Amen. God restrains, from our Bible study guide, God restrains His righteousness um, his righteous wrath and extends his grace anew. The psalmist exclaims, who knows the power of your anger? Psalm 90 verse 11. That was, Moses wrote that. Uh, implying that no one has ever experienced the full effect of God's anger against sin. And so there is a hope for people to replace, I'm sorry, to repent and gain wisdom for righteous living. Now I, that raises a lot of questions in my mind. I think there's one person who did experience the full extent of God's wrath, Jesus his Christ. anger, and that was Christ. He died the second death, and that's the death that the wicked will die in the end. God's wrath or his anger is simply his turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway. And of course, in the case of Christ, it was a, it was a demonstration so that we would know what, what the choices are. Um, thus leaving them to the inevitable, deadly, and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. And of course, that's represented in that famous verse, Romans 6, 23, for sin pays its wage, death. Now, this isn't God's punishment. Sin pays its wage. But God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. Ellen White then goes on, Jim. Psalm 6, 23, sin for no, sin. No, the, the one right below the quote, Ellen White quote. Could yes. they, that is the wicked, endure the glory of God and the Lamb? No, no. Years of probation were granted to them that they might form characters for heaven, but they have never trained their mind to love purity. They have never learned the language of heaven, and now it, it is too late a life of rebellion against God has unfitted them for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace would be torture to them. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. Good wow. Mercy, page 542, 543. Okay. So if God were to take all the wicked to heaven, what would it be for them? Hell. <laughs> hell. It would be torture. It would be hell. So the wicked are doing this thing to themselves. There's no place for them. When Jesus died, was that a result of the full effect of God's anger? Well, if you understand what God's anger is, the answer is yes. He was left. Jesus died the death that sinners will die in the end, caused by separation from the only source of life, 
uh, God the Father, and that's the desire of ages 753, 1 and 2. It is called the second death. Well, we certainly would recognize that it is true. We need to remember every day that our predicament is sin. It was never God's intent that we have all these problems. And even though we live at this end of the history of the human race, God's promises for eternal life are still valid. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world. Everyone, right? Whosoever. Huh? Whosoever. Everyone. Yes, okay. So God asks us to listen. What does that mean? Psalm 81, 7, 8. When you were in trouble, you called to me, and I, God, saved you. From my hiding place in the storm, I answered you. I put you to the test at the spring of Meribah. Listen, my people, to my warning. Israel, how I you wish you would listen to me. Wow. <laughs> the children of Israel, in their wanderings for those 40 years in the wilderness, should have learned a lesson <clears throat> many times that following God and His guidance was the right thing to do. Whenever they wandered away from His guidance, they ran into all kinds of troubles. But a good example is the experience found in Exodus 17, 1 through 7. Gordon? The whole Israelite community left the desert of sin, moving from one place to another at the now, command of the Lord. That doesn't mean that there was more, more sin in that place anywhere else in the world, or that all sin comes from there. That just happens to be the name. That's the name, desert of sin. Yeah. They made camp at Rephidim, but there was no water there to drink. They complained to Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses answered, why are you complaining? Why are you putting the Lord to the test? But the people were very thirsty and continued to complain to Moses. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Moses prayed earnestly to the Lord and said, what can I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, take some of the leaders of Israel with you and go on ahead of the people. Take along the stick with which you struck the Nile. I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. Moses did so in the presence of the leaders of Israel. Okay, question for you. Where was God when what was Moses was supposed to do this? I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Could they see God? No. How would they know which rock he was standing on? Okay. Verse, verse 7, the place was named Massa and Meribah because the Israelites complained and put the Lord to the test when they asked, is the Lord with us or not? Good News Bible. Read Psalm 105 is another psalm that we don't have time to read, unfortunately, but it's a great experience. This psalm discusses many of the times when Abraham's descendants were tested. What do we know about God, Abraham himself? What, what did he do in his daily activities? Do you remember what we've said in the past? He was running a university, and he was running a military establishment. He was a huge shepherd. I mean, phew, had a thousand souls in his household. Is God leading his people today toward into testing? What kind of testing might that be? Are we prompt in obeying God's will? Myra? This is why it says, God requires prompt and unquestioning obedience to his law. But men are asleep and paralyzed by the deceptions of Satan, who suggest excuses and subterfuges and Conquers their scruple, conquers their scruples, saying that he said to Eve in the garden, "Ye shall not surely die." Disobedience not only hardens the heart and the conscience of the guilty one, but it tends to corrupt the faith of others. That which looked very wrong to them at first gradually loses its appearance by being constantly before them, till finally. 
they question whether it is really a sin or unconsciously fall into the same error. Wow. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4. Do you have a favorite sin? <laughs> she addresses it there. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You won't surely die. That, yeah. Does it become harder and harder to resist every time you commit it? Where do most of our temptations come from? Well, this is it's in your mind. This is a story about the of Psalms, and of course, we're going to look at Psalm 141 in just a moment. But let's take a little uh, detour here, and remember, remember what it says in James. We're going to read it in just a oh, moment. There's no one. Yeah. Okay, I uh, next see what happened here. Let's try this again. James 1, 12 to 15 is uh -huh. the next text. Is it there? Yeah. I didn't put it in. I'm sorry. Okay. Psalm 141 is a prayer for protection from temptations from within and from without. The psalmist is not only endangered by the schemes of the wicked, there's a verse, but also is tempted to act like the wicked. The first weak point is self-control in speech, and the psalmist prays that the Lord will keep watch over the door of his lips. This image alludes to the guarding of our city gates that in biblical times protected the city. The temptation is also whether God's child will yield to the counsel of the righteous or be lured to be by the delicacies of the wicked. Delicacies of the wicked. What are the delicacies of the wicked? The psalmist depicts his heart as a primary threat because there the real battle happens. Only unceasing prayer of, or complete trust and devotion to God can save God's child from temptation. So here's our James 1, 12 to 15. Jim? Happy are those who remain faithful under trials, and because they or excuse me, because when they succeed in passing such a test, they will receive as their reward the life which God has promised to those who love Him. If people are tempted by such trials, they must not say, the temptation comes from God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and He, that is God, Himself tempts <coughs> no one. But people are tempted when they are drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires. Mm. Then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Okay, so well, where do most... That's a good summation in it. Where do most sins come from? Our own desires. Our own evil desires. Well, back to Psalm 141. Charles? Psalms 1, 1 to 4. Happy are those who reject the advice of the evil people, who do not follow the examples of sinners, or join those who have no use for God. Instead, they find joy in obeying the law of the Lord. And they study it day and night. And they study it day and night. They are like trees that grow beside this stream and bear fruit at the right time. Those leaves do not dry up. They Cheryl, succeed in every, everything they do. Um, okay, or you jumped I, over one section. Maybe Gordon can take that. Psalm 141.4 there. From the Bible Study Guide, it says, Psalms 141.4 depicts the progressive nature of temptation. First, the heart is inclined toward evil. Second, it practices evil deeds, the meaning in Hebrew underlines the repetitive character of the action. Third, the heart eats of the delicacies of the wicked, namely accepts their evil practices as something ter uh, something desirable from the Bible study guide for Wednesday. Okay, now Charles read us Psalm 1, 1 to 4. There are blessings that come from living righteous lives. Yes, I'll read it again. It's yeah. good to read, yeah. Happy are those who reject the advice of evil people who do not follow the examples of the sinners or join those who have no use for God. Instead, they find joy in obeying the law of the Lord and they study it day and night. They're like trees that grow beside a stream and that bear fruit all the right time, whose leaves do not dry up. 
they succeed in everything they do, but evil people are not like this at all. And our Bible study guide goes on of the many blessings promised to those who revere the Lord. Peace is perhaps one of the greatest. Mm. Psalm 1 depicts the righteous by a simile. Remember we've said that the Psalms, you know, the Psalms are all about similes of a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruits in season, whose leaf does not wither. This simile identifies the source of all blessings, namely abiding in God's presence in his sanctuary and enjoying uninterrupted and loving relationship with God. Unlike the wicked who are portrayed as chaff uh, with no stability, place and future, the righteous are like a fruitful tree with roots a place near God and eternal life. So, wow, our Bible study guide for Thursday. One of the exciting things we look forward to in the coming kingdom is the tree of life, standing on both sides of the river of life. But how could one tree supply the needs of all of God's children? So have you ever pictured what the tree of life is like? Tried to. It's on how many sides of the river? Both sides. Both sides. Yes. So that means the river goes where? Through it. Right through it. Now we've seen trees, some of us have driven through trees where there's a car, a place for a car to drive through, but I don't think any of us have seen a river going through a tree with both sides. Mm. But not only that, if you go back to the Old Testament and you look at the predictions of the future from Ezekiel, he suggests that there's gonna be trees of life all the way along the river. So we'll wait and see, but that's what it sounds like. Don't have to drive so far. Yeah. <laughs> One of the exciting things with, we look forward to in the coming kingdom is the tree of life. We've looked at that already. But look at Ezekiel 49, 47, 12. On each, bank of the, on each bank of the stream, all kinds of trees will grow and provide food. Their leaves will neither, never wither and they shall never stop bearing fruit. They will have fresh fruit every, every month. month. I was expecting something a little different than that. They will have fresh fruit every month because they are watered by the stream that flows from the temple. The trees will provide food and their leaves will be used for healing people. Wow. Goodness. So imagine that, a whole river and just trees all the way along it and every kind of imaginable fruit growing there. Just hmm. amazing. Okay, Revelation 22, one and two. The angel also showed me the river of the water of life, sparkling like crystal and coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb and flowing down the middle of the city street. So now there's not only a river, but there's a city street going through this tree, right? On each side of the river was the tree of life, which bears fruit 12 times a year, once each month, and its leaves are, from the healing, are for the healing of the nations. So what do you think? Are there lots of trees or is there just one? Lots of trees. Sounds like there's lots of them, doesn't it? Are there in fact many trees of life along that river which bear uh, new fruit each month? Sounds like it. What kind of dwelling places will we have in heaven? And life is not gonna be boring. It's That's not gonna be line. boring, that is for sure. Yes. Yeah, what kind of dwelling places will we have? Jim? Micah, Micah 4.4. 4. 4. Everyone will live in peace among his own vineyards and fig trees, and no one will make him afraid. The Lord Almighty has promised this. Psalms 122, verses 6 to 8. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you prosper. May there be peace inside your walls and safety in your palaces. Mm. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I say to Jerusalem, peace be with you. Good news, Bible. And Ellen White, Charles? In the Bible, the inheritance of the saved is called a country. Hebrews 11, 14 to 16. That the heavenly shepherd leads his flock to fountains of living water. The tree of life yields all fruits every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the services of the nations. There are even flowing streams, clear as crystal, and beside them waving trees 
cast their shadows upon the paths prepared for the ransom of the Lord. Wow. Let the wide spreading plains swell into hills and beauty. The mountains of God reared their lofty summits. On those peaceful plains, beside those living streams, God's people, so long pilgrims and wanderers shall find home. That's so beautiful. Wow. wow. Talking about the final... The great controversy. Yes. Yeah. The great controversy, yes. Okay, Gordon? Hebrews 11, 14 to 16, which is referenced in Ellen White. Those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own. They did not keep thinking about the country they had left. If they had, they would have had the chance to return. Instead, it was a better country they longed for, the heavenly country. And so God is not ashamed for them to call him their God mm. because he has prepared a city for them. Many years ago, I lived in East Africa and there was a conference held here in the United States and some of my friends who had been raised in the rural parts of East Africa came to the United States for that conference and they saw all the buildings here and the automatic doors and everything like that and they went back there and they they just, you know, they, they didn't even have words to describe to their friends the things they saw here in this country. So I think about that and I think, okay, we think we have all these conveniences and everything like this. We don't even have an idea of what heaven's going to be like. Not just like that guy. Uh, he, he said what he said, he says, you walk up to the door and it opens automatically. And it says, welcome, brother, welcome. <laughs> that was his, his comment about the back in the days when they, it was back in the early days of, fairly early days of automatic doors. So, the final ultimate form of blessing for the righteous is described in Revelation 21, and that's the whole chapter is all about heaven. Could we have a guaranteed right of entrance into that wonderful existence? A right of entrance? The Lord gave the right. Yeah. He prepared the way. Okay. I think the cheers. Why is the cross, why is the cross and what happened there? the guarantee of promises found in the New Testament of what God has in store for us. How can we get comfort for those promises even now? Bible study guide for now, February. Now, there's nothing nice about the cross. Why do we think about the, the wonders of heaven in terms of the cross? Because without the cross, there wouldn't be a resurrection. Well, That's true. What happened at the cross? What happened at the cross? While many Christians view the cross as the place where God paid the price for the forgiveness of our sins, there are problems with that idea. If God paid the price for my sins at the cross, is that a kind of indulgence? An indulgence is a guaranteed permission to commit a sin because that, that person has or had paid the price for forgiveness already. The Roman Catholic Church once offered indulgences to raise money to rebuild St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. And if Christ paid the price for all sins, shouldn't everyone be saved? Wouldn't that be the conclusion? If God, Christ paid the price for all sins, shouldn't everyone be saved? If that's all, all that's necessary to be saved. It's just someone pays my debts, right? In fact, the life and death of Jesus give us a chance, give us a choice. We can live lives as close as possible to the example given us by the life of Jesus, or we will die the awful death that he died, not on a cross, but death, separation, from, separation from life, uh, from the source of life, separated from his Father, the only source of life. And Ellen White says that Jesus standing, I mean, standing, whatever you want to call it, there on the cross, nailed there to the cross, and think he's been beaten in his back, and he's got crown of thorns on his head, and what was most concerning to him, the thing that overwhelmed him more than anything else. Why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? God. He could not see it God. It wasn't that he was, that the Father forsook him, it was that the, his people, the Elohim had forsaken him. No, his Father had in effect, as a demonstration of the results of sin, he, was, he, was, he wasn't a sinner, 
But his, God was demonstrating the results of sin. His plea was to the Elohim. Oh, there's nothing that says that. It does. No. You got a mis mistranslation. You, yeah, you've been, well, anyway. Well, uh, that, that's what it was, you know. Mm. I mean, he, if, if that didn't happen, the physiology of crucifixion would have mm. killed him uh, fairly soon, as you yeah. know. Uh, but uh, uh, losing all the blood, for example, also yeah. not being able to breathe, da da da. But no, he, he, the, his father turned his back on. Let's say yeah. that's. He said so. He, he, Jesus he, himself he, said so. Yeah, you know, you know, Lama Sabaktani, I think that's yeah. the word. Yeah. yeah. Why have you forsaken me? In these modern times, obtaining wisdom seems not to be so desirable as achieving happiness. People would rather be happy than wise. However, how can we rely, how can we truly be happy and live a fulfilled life without godly wisdom? The Psalms clearly say that we cannot. The good news is that we are not asked to choose between wisdom and happiness. Godly wisdom brings genuine happiness. Okay, and Psalm 1-1 that you already read, who's, who's, come, who's next here? Charles? Me? Sure, I'll read it again. Um, Happy are those who reject the advice of evil people, who do not follow the examples of the sinners or join those who have no use for God. Okay. Psalms 119.1, happy are those whose lives are faultless, who live according to the law of the Lord. Ellen White. Gordon, you can do that one. Okay. From Steps to Christ, Ellen White said, Thank God for the bright pictures which he has presented to us. Let us group together the blessed assurance of his love that we may look upon them continually. The Son of God leaving his Father's throne, clothing his divinity with humanity that he might rescue man from the power of Satan. His triumph in our behalf, opening heaven to men, revealing to human vision the presence the presence chamber where the deity unveils his glory. The fallen race uplifts from the pit of ruin into which sin had plunged it and brought again into connection with the infinite God and having endured the divine test through faith in our Redeemer, clothed in the righteousness of Christ and exalted in, to his throne. These are the pictures which God would have us contemplate. Wow. That's one long sentence. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Myra? Bible Study Guide says, How can God's Word become the source of one's delight and not merely instruction? How is feeding on God's Word related to abiding in Jesus Christ, the Word? John, from okay. John. Okay, one, one, John 1.1, 1, 1. In the beginning the Word already existed, and this is a question that has been this has been discussed by Christians or people who claim they were Christians from the time Jesus died until the present time. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The Quran calls Jesus the Word mm -hmm. right here. Yeah, but they don't think he was eternal with the Father. John 15, 5 through 7. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will bear much fruit. For you cannot, you can do nothing without me. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask for anything you wish and you shall have it. And I, when I was younger, I thought, man, I mean, is that, is that a blank check? Is God just going to give us whatever we want? Well, what I realized after a while is we wouldn't want anything that wasn't for our best good. And that's what God has already given us. Okay, Jim, Bible study guide. What happens when people consciously and constantly reject God's teaching? Psalms 81 and 95. Why do excuse me, why do you think that why do you think that happens from the Bible study guide for February? Okay, you want to go ahead and Psalms 81, verses 8 to 14. Listen, my people, to my warnings, O Israel. How I wish I, you would listen to me. You must never worship another god. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth, and I will feed you. But my people would not listen to me. 
Israel would not obey me. So I let them go their stubborn ways and do whatever they wanted. How I wish my people would listen to me. How I wish they would obey me. I wish I, could, I would quickly defeat their enemies and conquer their, their foes. Wow. And, good, and that's just what a, a parallel to, to um, Elo, Eloi, Eloi, why have you abandoned me? Eloi, yeah. here he is talking to his kids. Yeah. But okay, he's not, Charles. He's not, he never, Jesus never addressed his father as, as, as uh, my God. That's 12 now. 12. Bible study guide there. Okay, Bible study. Why can the way of the wicked sometimes appear more desirable than the counsel of the righteous? Psalms, one, Psalms 4, 141. That is, how do we deal with the apparent fact that often, oftentimes the wicked seem to be doing very well? Okay, in summary. In summary. Okay. Biblical wisdom is taught by the Old Testament is an understanding of crucial salvific uh, issues, such as our, on, our origins, creation, the law, the principles of God's character in our daily life, the fear of God, a reverence, reverent love that results in joyful obedience, and retribution, the fate of the righteous and the wicked. Wisdom also is practical knowledge that prepares us to live a mature and godly life in the home within our neighborhoods and at the workplace. Furthermore, biblical wisdom is godly advice for, the living, for living harmoniously with our spouse and children. And I've said before that I think that the reason God wants us to marry people of the opposite sex is because we need to learn how to give along with people who don't think quite like us. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay. There's a I need you. <laughs> <laughs> Confession. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Furthermore, biblical wisdom is godly advice for living harmoniously with our spouse and children. It equips us with principles that guide our use of money and many other aspects of daily existence. So, in this lesson, what have we learned? God wants you to listen. All uh, this, we want something to listen. This well, business of obedience, we should put that word on the side. He wants you to listen and li listen to his well, message. He has a message but, for healing. Uh, you, well, obedience in the Bible means a humble willingness to listen. People just need to understand that. That's what the word obedience means in the Bible. So that shouldn't be a problem. Well, it is a problem for a lot of people. Yeah. It is for a lot of people, truly. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that we enjoy from our weak, maybe and feeble efforts to follow your advice. It's a, such a blessing to us. Help us now as we seek to understand you better, that that may be our experience each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.